Well, good morning, Living Hope Church. It's great to be with you this Sunday morning and a special welcome to anyone that's joining us that's not from Living Hope, maybe from across the world even, as we are sharing our sermons now on social media. And even though we cannot be together, uh, we are still together as we come now through technology to worship God this Sunday. And we want to turn to His Word and to understand what God's going to teach us today and sing songs together. And you really use this as a time to still be together, even though we are apart. Also, if you're new to us and you want to know more about our church, you are welcome to visit our website at www.livinghopechurch.co.za. As you would have seen on our WhatsApp groups, we've been sending out some resources for you to enjoy on Mondays, and we'll do so again this coming Monday. So please make sure you don't miss those and catch up with all the resources that we recommend to you um, for the week ahead. Also, as you know, this uh, lockdown period and the COVID-19 virus crisis has impacted many families, um, not, even, um, not only across the world, but in our church. And so we want to come together as a family to uh, be able to care for some of those in need. Um, some of the people can't work, of course, and that means no income and struggling to pay rent and, and the basic needs. So we want to be able to put our resources together and care for one another in our family. So please be on the lookout for more details about that this week as well. Our deacons are making a good plan and they'll be communicating some of those ways you can contribute towards the deacon fund this week. We also want you to know that um, there are opportunities for us to worship God next Sunday as it's Easter weekend. And so we're going to be sending out some details on uh, the Easter service, um, the Good Friday service on Friday, and Doomy will be sharing us with us from God's Word. And then uh, Sunday will be Pastor Josh uh, doing a special service for us for Easter Sunday. And so please, also next week, we'll be sending out some details on how to make that special as a church. Some of our GCs have actually continued to meet, and they've used online platforms like Zoom to fellowship over um, technology. And uh, so we want to encourage you to keep doing that if, you are, if it's possible. Uh, but we know that not everyone is able to do that. Um, but then also have the mindset that we want to be able to reach out to others. Um, take this time um, to pick up the, the phone book and see who you can reach out to in the church. And just encourage them and connect with them um, over WhatsApp or a phone call or whatever it might be. All right. Well, we want to transition now to our time of worship this Sunday. And to get us going, I thought we could read from Psalm 46. Psalm 46. It's a great psalm where um, the psalmist is encouraging us to take refuge in God. Um, and so I want to read for us this psalm. And I just want you to enjoy who we serve, the God, the Almighty God that is even in control of this virus. Let me read for us. He says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage and the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Then he writes these comforting words in verse 8. He says, Come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes the war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fires. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Isn't it comforting to know that God is with us even during this time? He is our present help in our trouble. Let us go to Him now in prayer and ask Him that He would Bless our time together as we listen to His Word, as we sing songs and in our homes and seek to exalt His name. Let's pray. Father God, we thank You so much for Your Word. Thank You that Your Word is a comfort 
to our soul. A comfort to us knowing that we worship the God who is in control of all things. We worship the God that we can take refuge in. The one that is sovereignly in control of all things. Thank you, God, that you draw close to us in times like these. Thank you that you're a God that is in creation. You're everywhere and nothing is outside of your control. Thank you that even though there's so much suffering around us, we can take refuge in knowing that you are with us. Father, we want to lift up some of our families to you. Those who are particularly in need in this time, that have been affected by this virus. Father, we pray that you would provide and help us to come together as a family to be able to provide for some of these needs. Father, we want to thank you for the way that you are healing people, even those who have been affected by this virus. Thank you that we can read the statistics and see so many people are getting better. But help us now that even in this lockdown time, that we would use this time to draw closer to you. That we would use this time to exalt your name. And even as we look forward to Easter weekend next Sunday, Lord, that we would use that time to proclaim the goodness of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We have been given the special message, and Lord, we want to even use all the platforms we have to make Jesus look beautiful. So, Father, I pray that you would be exalted now to use your word and to penetrate our hearts and comfort us, encourage us, and um, that you would use Pastor Alan now to teach us your word and um, the songs that we're going to sing to really exalt your name. And we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, church, enjoy the message from Pastor Alan now and the songs that you can sing together that we've shared on the group and the worship guide. And I pray that this would be a sweet time. And as always, feel free to share some of the encouragements that you have experienced and a photo maybe here and there where your family is worshiping together. We love seeing those. And so church, again, we just want to say that we love you so much and we can't wait for us to be back together again. All right, so have a wonderful worship time together this Sunday. Bye-bye. Good morning, Living Hope Church. It's uh, wonderful to be able to share the Word of God with you today. Uh, in spite of all of the challenges that we're facing during the coronavirus outbreak and uh, this lockdown that we're going through. But today I'd like to open the Word of God with you from Second Chronicles chapter 26, verses 1 to 23. And what I'm going to show you in this text is how to destroy yourself fast. How to destroy yourself fast. If you want to ruin your life, this is a quick and easy way to do it. So, first, uh, Second Chronicles chapter 26, verse 1, we begin to read the story of King Isaiah. And King Isaiah was living in uh, Jerusalem at the time when the whole nation of Israel and Judah were descending into calamity. They were on their way into the exile. They were about to be destroyed by God, about to be removed from their land by God. And the book of Chronicles, First and Second Chronicles, was written in order to encourage people who were actually suffering during the, those calamities that the prophets prophesied. So as we look at the, the calamity of the whole nation, and as we look at the calamity in the life of Isaiah, I would like to show you how it is that if you are heading toward calamity in your own life, how you can uh, destroy yourself fast in, in one short step, and how if you are already destroying yourself, how you can come out of that uh, miserable decline. So I'm going to begin reading Second Chronicles chapter 26. And the writer says, Then all the people of Judah took Isaiah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in place of his father Amaziah. He was the one who rebuilt Elath and restored it to Judah after Amaziah rested with his fathers. Now it's remarkable as you look at the, the life of King Isaiah that as he begins to reign, he's 16 years old when he begins to reign. And that is a remarkable thing for a king. You can imagine being 16 years old and having to take charge of the entire kingdom. And what's more, you read a note there about the fact that he, Isaiah, was the one who restored this um, city of Elath 
And the city of Elath was an important uh, trade city on the north side of the Red Sea. It was a very important seaport. And uh, Isaiah's father had uh, tried to restore that, that uh, place, th that city to Israel, but he had failed. There'd been a, a terrible war there, but his campaign there had failed. So for this boy, this uh, young man who became king at 16 years old to, to launch into this venture at that age, or maybe shortly after that, and to actually accomplish what his father had failed at was a remarkable thing. So the point is that God is granting him success. God is granting him remarkable success in his reign. And verses 3 and 4, if we read those verses, it says there, Isaiah was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 52 years. 52-year reign that this boy had after being crowned king. His mother's name was Jechaliah, and she was from Jerusalem. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father Amaziah had done. So we see this this boy being given success by God, which 52-year reign at that time, if you know the the history of the kings of Israel and Judah, you know that was a significant reign. In verse 5, we notice that God grants Isaiah success. And Isaiah uh, humbly depends on God as he reigns as king and as he grows as, as a man of God. In verse 5, it says, um, he sought the Lord during the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of the Lord. As long as he sought the Lord, God gave him success. And that's a, that is right at the heart of what I'm trying to say today. You see this man, a young man, he's made king. He's put in a situation uh, that many 16-year-olds have never been in. And he has to um, conduct himself as a man of God. And the only way he can do that is by taking advice from an older man, Zechariah, who trains him and helps him. And King Isaiah, even though he's the king, he humbly submits to the leadership of this older, wiser man. And God just gives him massive success. And we speak about, in, in the Bible, we speak about a thing that we call the retribution principle, where we see God granting a, a king like Isaiah success, and it seems to be saying that if you live a godly life, God will give you success, he'll make your life successful. And if you do not live a godly life, then God will punish you with all kinds of plagues and, and problems in your life. And it doesn't seem from the rest of Scripture that this is, this is as direct as it comes across in this text. We're going to speak a little bit more about that a little bit later. But my main point here is that God gave this king success. God made him very successful, and he was a godly man, and he did what was right. Secondly, we notice that God made this King Isaiah very powerful outside of his country. So if we look at verses 6 to 8, we notice that outside of his country, God gave him remarkable success. Verse 6 says, uh, he went to war against the Philistines and he broke down the walls of Gath, Jabna and Ashdod. He then rebuilt towns near Ashdod and elsewhere among the Philistines. God helped him against the Philistines and against the Arabs who lived in Gul, uh, Gerbaal and against the Munites. The Ammonites brought tribute to Isaiah, and his fame spread as far as the border of Egypt, because he had become very powerful. So we see him, this king, conquering the Philistines in their major cities, which was a huge thing because the Philistines had given, you know from the narratives in, in the Bible, you know that the Philistines gave them huge trouble all the way throughout their histories. And not only did he conquer the, the Philistines in their major cities, but he also conquered a number of other people, the, the Munites and the Arabs living in Gerbaal, which in Gerbaal apparently is, is another very important trading center. So he's establishing the country not only through um, reigning as a wise king, but also through offensive action outside of his country. He's not simply defending the country against outside of, uh, attackers. He's in such a solid position that he's able to go outside of his own country and attack other kings and to restore territories that used to belong to them but no longer belong to them. Notice also that he built forts. 
in those other territories that he conquered and that means that he was able not only to conquer those territories but to hold those territories for the the nation of nations of Israel and, and Judah so it's remarkable as we look at uh, commentators on this and read the literature about this time there's actually remarkable archaeological evidence to show the the factual nature of all of these uh, claims that this um, these chapters make regarding King Isaiah notice also that the Ammonites in this text they come to pay tribute to him the Ammonites brought tribute to Isaiah and his frame fame spread as far as the border of Egypt so he's so powerful that even external nations are bringing him tribute they're bringing him let's call it tax they 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 collecting tax and bringing it to him so he became famous because of his great power this was a powerful king a 52 year reign he is able to secure a very powerful rule one of the things that you'll notice about this text is that as Isaiah is conquering the the Philistines and as he is uh, conquering Elath you'll notice that if you read the history that King Solomon had conquered Elath before him and uh, and of course Elath had slipped out of the control of Judah again and so this king is um, attributed with the the conquering of Elath again which means he's doing he's he's um, credited with a type of heroic battle the type of heroic victory that Solomon was attributed with so we see him having a sort of a Solomonic glory in this moment achieving something that Solomon did we also see him doing something that David did you remember David conquered the Philistines and this conquering of the Philistines under David's hand was a, a remarkable victory after all of the years that the the Philistines had uh, terrorized Israel and Judah so he's given a sort of a Davidic authority as well we see these things all sort of coming together in the reputation the powerful powerful reputation of King Isaiah so the point here is that outside of his land outside of Judah Isaiah was a very powerful king nobody would argue with him because of his great power and then we can move on to the next couple of verses 2nd Chronicles chapter 9 uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 26 verse 9 to 15 and if we read these verses it says Isaiah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate at the valley gate and at the angle of the wall he fortified them he also built towers in the desert and dug many cisterns because he had much livestock in the foothill in the foothills and in the plain he had people working his fields and vineyards in the hills and in the fertile lands for he loved the soil verse 11 says Isaiah had a well-trained army ready to go out by divisions according to their numbers as mustered by Jeel the secretary and Maaseah the officer under the command under the direction of Hananiah one of the royal officials the total number of family leaders over the fighting men was 2600 under their command was an army of 307,500 men trained for war a powerful force to support the king against his enemies Isaiah provided shields and spears, helmets, coats of armor, bows and sling stones for the entire army. In Jerusalem he made machines designed by skillful men for use on the towers and on the corner on the corner defenses to shoot arrows and hurl large stones. His fame spread far and wide for he was greatly helped until he became powerful. So here we see more evidence of Isaiah's power. We see him building projects inside of the, the land of Judah and we know that uh, in the biblical economy that a person who is engaging in building projects who is actually constructing inside of the land is evidencing a sign of God's favor and what's more is this is a, a sign of God's favor after the earthquake that is mentioned by Amos and Zechariah Amos 1 verse 1 and Zechariah 14 verse 5 there's this earthquake in fact it must have been such a significant earthquake because we read that the the people in the city were fleeing in terror from the city 
That must have been a significant earthquake. And so after the significant earthquake and Isaiah is busy rebuilding and we see the destructive attack on Israel, the destructive attack of Israel from the north, they came and they tried to destroy their own brothers. And we see this man, Isaiah, this king, Isaiah, cultivating flocks and, and herds and developing agriculture and uh, building watchtowers and cisterns and you know to build a cistern is not a, a small thing they had to dig a huge big cavern into limestone so it took significant time for them to dig out these cisterns so he was able he was so powerful and and so confident in his position that he was able to to cultivate the land to the point where he was sowing fields where he was planting vineyards which take significant time to grow he was um, building watchtowers which were not really for the for the the army they were actually for um, shepherds the people the farmers who were looking after the fields if they saw trouble coming they could run to the watchtower and they could be safe even if the 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 attackers would come to their fields or their flocks at least the 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 shepherds and the the farmers would be safe in those watchtowers so Isaiah was a man who who had a deep heart he was a man who loved the soil. That's what the text says here. He loved the soil. There was something that he, that he found wonderful about the soil. So the things that Isaiah really desired, the things that he really longed for, the things that were, were close to Isaiah's heart were the things that he was protecting. He was producing safety for his nation. He was producing food for his nation. He was producing a situation in which the 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 farmers could be safe in in the possibility of an attack i don't know who would have been foolish enough to attack a king so powerful but um as these things are so close to his heart you notice that as he's speaking about the agriculture here and the, how close to his heart these things are you realize that Isaiah is loving this process it is reaching deep down into his personal desires so he's loving it. He's, he's loving the moments. He's loving the process. He's loving the prosperity. He's loving the developments. He's loving all of these features about the, the world in which he's living, the world that God has given him control over. We'll notice in this text as well that I read that he had a, a powerful and well-trained army. He has 307,500 uh, 307, soldiers who were able to go to war and it says that they were well trained and he had 2600 officers over them and they could protect him they could look after him in the event of an attack and I do think that the other nations feared this man to the point where attacking him would have been absolute folly it's noticeable here as we look at what Isaiah developed and I've been doing a little bit of research on this and trying to find out exactly how we should understand this and there seems to be a division among commentators who who comment on these war machines that Isaiah developed so the text says here that he developed war machines that could um, hurl large stones verse 15 in Jerusalem he made machines designed by skillful men for use on the towers and on the corner defenses to shoot arrows and hurl large, hurl large stones and you know, there, there are a lot of commentators who say that this was not possible in Isaiah's day, and there are others who simply take this at face value and say, yes, well, this is what he did. He was before his time. There are others who um, interpret the words differently to say that these were um, mechanisms that he developed in order to um, defend the city against machines that hurl large stones and that shoot arrows and or just people hurling large stones and and uh, archers shooting arrows we're not sure exactly but if we take this text at face value we realize that um, this man Isaiah was ahead of his time in technology and he did a, re a remarkable thing for this city of Jerusalem and for Judea so his fame spread because God helped him greatly and he became powerful so we've noticed that he became successful in the beginning as he was under the tutelage of Zechariah we notice that he becomes powerful as he attacks enemies outside of Judah 
and he makes Judah safe and he even captures trading ports. So God gives him success and God grants him power. And here in this last text where it says his fame spread far and wide for he was greatly helped until he became powerful. You notice that's a passive verb which means he was greatly helped. God God did something for him. God helped him. It happened to him that God helped him. Which means that that all of his fame and all of his power was derived from God. He, he, yes, he worked towards uh, becoming a success, but all of his fame and all of his power came from God. It was a thing from God. But the point is that God made him powerful. He was a powerful, powerful, successful king. So the text is built up in such a way that that is a very big point. This is a, a very... A strong point that you need to notice in this whole text. King Isaiah is a very, very powerful king. Now we begin to read from verse 16. Second Chronicles chapter 26, verse 16. We read this. So these dreadful words. But after Isaiah became powerful, his pride led to his downfall. He was unfaithful to the Lord his God and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. What a dreadful turn in this story. We've, been seen, we've seen him becoming king at 16 years old. We've seen him being successful as he humbly learns from Zechariah. We've seen him gaining uh, power as he conquers enemies outside of his land. We see him gaining power as he establishes the economy of his land. We've seen him gain, gaining power as he establishes a mighty army and fortresses and just power after power after power. We see this king raising up. And suddenly we read these words, but Isaiah, after Isaiah became powerful, his pride led to his downfall. You know, we, we would expect to read words like, uh, after he became powerful, another king rose up and, and came and flooded the land and, and destroyed him. You might expect something like that, some great big um, uh, calamity in the story. But what we're reading about is his own pride. We're speaking about how Isaiah destroyed himself really fast with his own pride. And we realize if we're looking at the power of Isaiah, we realize what a terribly, terribly destructive thing pride is. So the whole text that we've been looking at weaves these warnings, these warnings of pride into his tale of success. So, for example, if you look at verse 5, we'll notice what the writer said. Um, he says, yeah, he sought the Lord, he sought God during the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of the Lord. As long as he sought the Lord, God gave him success. And then down in verse 15, if we read that same thing, in Jerusalem he made machines designed by skillful men for use on the towers and on the corner defenses to shoot arrows and hurl large stones. His fame spread far and wide, for he was greatly helped until he became powerful. And it seems that even in that second warning, it seems that there was a, a process by which he was becoming more and more and more powerful. And then suddenly that process of becoming powerful stopped. There was a halt in the process. His, he, his power plateaued and he did not continue to be more powerful. What a terrible, terrible point that is in his life. And in verse 16 it says, but after Isaiah became powerful, his pride led to his downfall. He was unfaithful to the Lord his God. So we notice these warnings, this how the whole passage is built on this man's ascent to power and then how this man, all of this power comes crashing down because of this man's pride. So it's after he became powerful, he became proud. So this process of becoming proud. It didn't just happen. It, it happened through all of the adulation, all of the acceptance, all of the love of the people that he loved. And you think of the farmers as he's building towers for them and they're so grateful that he's building towers for them so they could be safe and how, how he received the nod 
of all of the people, how the, the soldiers in the army, they, they agreed with all of the decisions he was taking and sending them to war and the, the glory and the success and the victory that they had as they came back after conquering nations and establishing forts there. You can imagine the whole process um, of, of success and power had, had this time in his heart of deceiving him and he began to think that his power made him acceptable to God. Even if he knows what he's doing wrong, he comes into the temple of the Lord and he thinks that because he's a powerful man, because of his power and his acceptance by the people, that this act of irreverence is acceptable to God. Let us never forget the fact that as we meet with success in this world and as we have a degree of power in this world, our success is always something that God has given us. Our success does not make us important people. Our success is something that we say thank you to God for because we do not have anything, says Paul to the Corinthians, that we have not received. So he became powerful. And it's, it's interesting, as I was reading the, the, the African Bible commentary, that they noticed there that uh, in this text, in Lingala, there's a, a phrase for this that he's, he became big-headed. His head became big. And uh, some of you might uh, recognize that and be able to share that with us in, a, in proper format. But that's pretty much what happened to him. His head got big. In fact, his head got so big that he walked straight into the temple of God. He walked into the temple of the Lord and he chose... To disobey all of the laws in the Old Testament that have to do with the, all of the procedures and the processes of the house of God. And he chose to walk in there and do what was wrong because he was a powerful person. Nobody could stop him. So he thought he was acceptable to God. He thought God would bless him. He thought God would do something for him, make him possibly make him even more powerful. It is actually interesting that in in uh, 2 Kings verse uh, 2 Kings chapter 15. It's interesting that in this same king's reign, he has a different name there. We won't speak about that now. Um, but his reign was marked by the fact that he did not um, put an end to all of the high places. Israel had sinned against God by setting up different places to worship that were not the temple of God, where God had commanded them to worship only. And he had allowed all of those other places to remain in operation during his reign. And I would say, as I'm reading this text, it's just my opinion, that this is an evidence, an early ev evidence, excuse me, of King Isaiah's irreverence towards God as he gained, as he, as he um, ascended in success and glory and reputation and victory. We see him in a position where he begins to feel less and less, less and less reverent. And as he comes into the temple of the Lord, we notice 80 courageous priests. They confront him and they confront him over his unfaithfulness to the Lord. It says here in verse 17, Azariah the priest with 80 other courageous priests of the Lord followed him in. They confronted him and said, It is not right for you, Isaiah, to burn incense to the Lord. That is for the priests, the descendants of Aaron, who have been consecrated to burn incense. Leave the sanctuary, for you have been unfaithful, and you will not be honored by the Lord. You will not be honored, Isaiah. What was he going in there for? It seems that he must have been going in there to burn incense to the Lord, to bring pleasure to God, to please God in some way, and maybe to earn God's favor in some way. But the priests are saying to him, no, this is not going to bring you honor. This is going to bring, uh, it's going to destroy your glory. This is going to bring you disgrace, and you are going to wither away through this. You're not going to be made stronger. You're going to be destroyed through this process. And we notice what happens with King Isaiah. Now, you and I might like to think that if this was you or I going into the temple of the Lord and 80 courageous priests come into the temple of the Lord, they follow us in. And while we're standing there with a censer in our hand to burn incense to God because we think that this is the right thing to do, we think that this is going to help us, we think that this is going to bring us more glory, we think this is going to bring us more success. And these priests come in and they stand between 
between what we think and what, what is right. And we, we, we begin to say to these priests, well, who gives you the right to tell me what to do? I'm a powerful person. I'm a successful person. God has been blessing me for almost five decades. Five decades God has been blessing me. And you priests want to come and tell me that God's not going to bless me. I know what, uh, what makes God bless me. I know the right things to do in order for God to bless me. You can imagine what, what was happening inside of King Isaiah's heart as he was beginning, as he was thinking through what he was going to say to these priests as they confront him. They're confronting the king. So verse 19 says, Isaiah, who had a censer in his hand, ready to burn incense, became angry. He became angry. We notice that in the beginning, in verse uh, 16, it says, But after Isaiah became powerful, his pride led to his downfall. And now we see what pride looks like in verse 19. We tie these two things together. We've got pride and we've got anger. And isn't it fascinating how a proud person becomes angry very quickly? And this is what happened to King Isaiah. He becomes angry very quickly. So they warn him to leave the temple. He becomes angry with them. And he has a censer in his hand. He's this uh, little item that they used to use. Uh, a little um, metal container that they had some coals in. And they would put uh, incense on the hot coals. And it would make a nice smell. The, the smell of the incense evaporating into the air. And he's holding the censer in his hand in order to, to perform an act of worship. But at the same time, he's standing there with this in the middle of this act of worship and he's becoming angry. He's raging against the priest inside of the house of God. And I'm hoping that you can see that this moment, this one moment, is emphasized in the story. You see his great power. You see his great success. And then you see him in all of his greatness, in all of his pride, walking in, into the temple of God as if he has a right to be there. And as if, as if he has a right to worship in a way that God has said, no, you shouldn't worship in this way. And the priests come in and they confront him. And the whole story is surrounded by this one moment as this priest, as this king, Isaiah, is standing with a censer in his hand and he's shouting and he's raging against the priest. I'm trying to worship here. You know, why are you getting in the way of me worshipping? I have a right to worship God in the way I choose to worship God. We can imagine these moments, this, this like one moment where you can almost just stand, you can suspend the whole animation, you can just stop the whole process and you can stare at this king and you can say, what is going on here? This king, this powerful king is in the temple of the Lord. He's raging in the presence of the priests. And he's raging in front of the altar of the Lord God Almighty. He's doing what's wrong in this place. And I'm hoping you can see how dangerous that is. I'm hoping you can see how dangerous this pride is. It, it drove him, as it were, straight into the face, straight into the jaws of this lion. He's putting himself in danger that you cannot even imagine. Right in front of the temple of the Lord, sinning against God, not taking warning from the priests who have come in to, to uh, steer him away from this reckless course. It says in verse 21, uh, sorry, go back. While he was raging, this is verse 19, while he was raging at the priests in their presence before the incense altar in the Lord's temple, leprosy broke out on his forehead. As these priests are standing staring at this man, raging against them. And all of them just staring at him, they see this, this patch of leprosy breaking out on his forehead. And if we read what this, this leprosy is all about in, uh, in Bible times, it, it really seems from all of the sources that I've read that what we call leprosy today is really not what was called leprosy in Bible times, especially in the Levitical laws. If you see what, how leprosy was described, it's definitely a different type of sickness, a different type of skin disease to what we know as leprosy today. But it seems probably the best thing that we could describe this as 
is a a skin disease that if you if you think of the word that it, that is called the definition of the word leprosy it means that it's a something that is destructive it's something that strikes you down it's something that is a scourge it's something that plagues you on and on and on and you can't get rid of it it's something that no medicine will will heal it's a skin disease and it it may have been in the form of blisters and those blisters could have been open and and uh, weeping you know bleeding out or it could have been some type of a fungus or something like that but whatever it was it, this the skin disease this terrible and ugly and disgusting skin disease broke out on this king's forehead as he was raging against the priest in the temple of the Lord it was absolutely clear that God had spoken in that situation it's as if God had added his voice to the voices of the priests and he had said Isaiah I'm not happy about this you've become proud you are not taking warning you are completely in the wrong place here you should not be here and it's as if God is speaking to Isaiah at the same time that those priests are speaking to him and the priests as they stare at Isaiah in this moment as he's raging against the Lord and this skin disease breaks out on his forehead the priests become alarmed they become filled with fear and they hurry the king out of the temple of the Lord. And it says here that um, when Azariah the chief priest, this is verse 20, and the other priests looked at him, they saw that he had leprosy on his forehead. So they hurried him out. Indeed, he himself was eager to leave because the Lord had afflicted him. He is struck down by God in the temple of God. And the priests are telling him, come out, come out. And he says, yes, I want to go, I want to go. And now he's filled with fear. He's filled with a sense of dread. He's, he's realized that God has touched him. The God that has given him success all of these 52 years of his reign, or, or maybe close to 52 years by that stage, um, all of the God who has given him that success over all of those years of his reign has now touched him negatively. And this is a new experience. It is a terrifying experience for him as he faces the God of Israel, the Lord, the God of his fathers, Isaac, um, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And he's eager to leave the temple because God himself has afflicted him. So his leprosy that he has received as a result of his own sin torments him until the time of his death we read there verse 21 King Isaiah had leprosy until the day he died he lived in a separate house leprous and excluded from the temple of the Lord Jotham his son had charge of the palace and governed the people of the land and we can read that um, that verse with such a sense of sadness because we've seen through the whole narrative in this whole chapter we've seen him uh, receiving success we've seen him gaining victory we've seen him becoming more and more and more powerful so that his fame spreads all the way to Egypt he's got this massive reputation and no one dares to attack him he's at he's at peace in his own home and the people are loving him and suddenly this one disease this one moment this one hour has destroyed this is taken him down this has destroyed him really fast everything that he wished for everything that he longed for everything that he treasured God has targeted everything that this man really wanted out of life the thing that he really desired God has targeted that in one touch and it's as a result of this man's pride what he expected in contrast to what he received was a glorious reputation at the end of his life and rest but now he has to live in isolation he can't move around among the people that he loves he can't see the smiles on the faces of the farmers that he's protected with those towers he can't go to Elath and and watch the ships coming into the harbor there he can't do trade he can't walk around in public in his kingly garments he can't see the people saying uh, well done king on this military victory that we heard about what a wonderful victory that was he doesn't see his armed forces he doesn't hear the soldiers chanting and shouting the victory cries and and giving him all of the glory for the success that they've had in their in their military victory we see him excluded from kingly functions in the palace we see his reputation crumbling away so that he's oh that's that sick king who's 
con uh, confined to his house. We see him, even though he was so successful, we see that his, his son is ruling in the palace in his place. He can't even go and rule in the palace anymore. So there's somebody else who is sitting in that position of privilege and glory. And not only that, but burial in ancient times and in the East still is, is a very, very important thing as we, as we have in different cultures around the world. And he can't even be buried in the place where the kings are buried. He's buried near his fathers. It says here in verse 22, the other events of Isaiah's reign from beginning to end are recorded by the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos. Isaiah, excuse me, Isaiah rested with his fathers and was buried near them. Notice that he was buried near them in a field for burial that belonged to the kings. For people said he had leprosy. And Jotham, his son, succeeded him as king. So he couldn't even be buried with the kings. He had to be buried in a field near the kings. There was some kind of stigma even in his death as he died. So he was a strong king whose death was mourned. And that represented huge coming trouble in the nation of Israel. So my point in the story is that Isaiah was a massively successful king. From the age of 16 years old, and he was humble and receptive to the teaching of the word of God. God granted him success both inside of his country, economically, um, agriculturally, in every way we see the country flourishing. Outside of his country, we see him um, conquering nations that had troubled Israel for a long time. We see him making Israel, uh, making Judah a, a very peaceful place to live where people could work in peace and have a happy life and enjoy the fruit of the vine and the crops coming in from the field and have music. And after all of that success, we see him taken down. He destroys himself fast with his pride. A quick way to destroy 52 years of success. Now I'd like to just finish here with just a few comments on application. So you can also destroy yourself fast too. It's not just King Isaiah, but you yourself can destroy yourself fast. Simply fail to kill your pride. Simply allow pride to keep growing and growing and growing inside of you. And not put that pride to death. You can destroy your entire life very fast by allowing pride to thrive in your heart. So here are some lessons that we can, we can think through as we apply this to our own lives. The first is this. Do not interpret your own success as an exemption from cultivating humility. It doesn't matter how, how powerful you become in this world. You must become a humble person. You must work on humility because your pride can destroy everything you've built up throughout your entire life. Like Isaiah, 52 years of cultivated, cultivated success destroyed in one hour by secretly cultivated sin. You notice also that Lucifer being one of, if not the most powerful and glorious angel that God ever created, he falls right out of heaven, right out of the favor of God because of his own pride. Next point is that the Bible does not always connect sin and sickness directly. So you might think to yourself, all right, uh, get into this retrib retribution principle and let me say if I work hard God is going to bless me if I sin like his, like King Isaiah then God is going to punish me therefore if I do what's right I get what's good if I do what's wrong I get what's bad and it's interesting to notice that the Bible doesn't always connect uh, a good life with success or sin personal sinfulness with destruction because you see King Isaiah he was not the only king who became successful but God didn't uh, strike every single king who failed with physical sickness. For example, if we look at Psalm 73, we see the psalmist speaking about um, how some people live long, healthy, happy lives, but they are wicked people. But then also we can see other texts like um, Job, for example, the whole book of Job. We see a man whom God calls godly and upright. But God chooses for Job to suffer some terrible, terrible sicknesses. 
we think of the fact that while these things are not always directly tied, we know also that God does actually warn you that if you live a sinful life, He may punish you with sickness. For example, 1 Corinthians 11, when He warns us about eating and drinking at the communion table in an unworthy way, He may punish you in that way. And He may not. God is a person, He's not a machine. But in every situation, God through suffering and through success will expose your heart. He will show what is really inside there. If you are suffering, always treat your suffering as discipline because God is exposing your heart. If you're like King Isaiah who went into the temple and he had a plan to go and worship God with a censer in his hand and the priests raged against him, I mean the priests confronted him and he raged against the priests, that is showing your heart. If something stands in your way, it is showing your heart. If you're a proud person, you're going to become angry when people stand in your way. So God is exposing your heart through these difficulties. So the Bible does not always connect suffering, um, pride and uh, sin and sickness directly. But the Bible warns you that it is possible that if you continue to sin, God may discipline you in that way. In fact, I was just thinking as well of the earthquake. That was a warning in, in Isaiah's day. It was a warning that God may be waking Isaiah up and saying, hey, stop and listen. And after he rebuilt, God may have been speaking to him through that. Now, remember, if God doesn't, if God grants you success, that doesn't mean that everything you do is automatically approved either. You need to listen to wise people who oppose you. A proud person will not listen to wise people who oppose them. You need to listen to wise advice. So Hezekiah's pride ended up in him being excluded from that which he longed for the most, the approval of the people, looking good in public, being accepted by those people, be, receiving uh, praise from God for all of the, the, the righteous things that he had done. And he lost all of that stuff. He lost everything that he wanted to because of his pride. So it doesn't mean that if God grants you success, that God automatically approves of everything you do and that that it doesn't matter what you do, you will always be approved of by God. So another side of that coin, of course, is that you don't actually have to be successful or powerful in order to be proud. You can be the poorest and most dependent person in this world, but you can still be a proud person. How do you, how do you know if you're proud? Somebody says something to you, then you become angry. You know that there's probably a flame of pride burning there in your heart. So I'd like to just finish off with two suggestions here. First, I'm going to ask you a few questions. You can say to yourself, all right, let me ask myself these questions. And these questions will help you to realize whether there is pride in your heart or not. And, and I'm sure as you read these questions, you're going to be convicted by the Holy Spirit of sin. And may God grant you repentance in the face of this so that you don't destroy yourself fast like King Isaiah did. So think of these questions for a moment. What do you want people to honor you for? If you don't get that honor, does that make you angry? There's pride. How do you want people to talk about you? In fact, how do you want people to talk about you so much that if they don't talk about you in that way, you feel angry? Do you get angry, angry when people don't thank you or applaud you for the things that you do? Do you take offense easily at what people say of what, or of what you think people's body language is communicating? If people communicate to you with body language and say, I don't like the way that person's looking to me, does that make, does that make you feel angry? Does it, does it uh, make you take offense easily? Do you commit your ordinary days and activities to the Lord? Or do you just come to God with your big risky plans? You know, like we want to move house or we want to uh, travel overseas or we want to start a new business or something like that. Do you just bring those to God or do you ask God to help you with the ordinary things in your life as well? That is definitely an evidence of pride. Um, do you become impatient with people who are not as skilled or as clever or as quick as you think you are? People that you have to wait for and people that slow you down. Do you get angry with those people? 
And this is a big question. I left it towards the end because it is, it is of critical importance. Do you see Jesus Christ as your only success before God? Or do you think God is impressed by who you are? Do you think that you're adding something to what Jesus Christ did by living a life that God will be impressed? Yes, God is impressed with Jesus, but God is really going to be impressed with me. If that's what you think, then there's pride in your heart. So the final thing here is that I've put together a few steps that you can take in order to put pride to death in your life. And of course, acronyms don't always work out the way you want them to work, but here's a ridiculous little acronym for you. You can call it DIDSEP. <laughs> DIDSEP. So it's D-I-D-S-E-P if you want to memorize uh, an acronym like that. But the first, the first um, letter D in the acronym is if you want to put your pride to death, depend on God in prayer. You can't do this alone. You need to depend on God. Depend on God in prayer. Secondly, you need to identify your pride and the pattern that your pride takes in your life. Ask those questions that I just listed a moment ago and see, all right, I become offended when people don't thank me for the things that I do. All right, there I've identified a sin and I need to identify this happens every time or this happens when a particular person uh, doesn't thank me for a particular thing that I do. So identify the nature of your pride and the pattern that it takes in your life. Write it down on a piece of paper so you can see what it looks like. See what you're fighting against. So depend on God in prayer. Identify pride and its pattern. And then thirdly, the DID, the third letter in the acronym, is destroy pride. Destroy it both inside of your heart and in its outside actions. So of course when King Isaiah went into the temple of the Lord, there was pride inside of his heart, but the outside action caused him to actually walk into the temple of God and to, and to sin against God in that way. So kill pride. Don't allow it. those thoughts, ah, that person didn't thank me. And then you speak to that person, you say, no, it's no problem. It doesn't bother me at all. You know, deal with it inside. But deal with the outside manifestations as well, because then you're not only being proud inside, but you're lying to that person as well. You're deceiving them. You, you're making them think that it's okay with you, but inside you're actually seething against them. And the issue is not to tell them, no, I'm very angry with you. The issue is for you to destroy the pride, to destroy it inside of your heart. And you say to yourself, no, I will not be proud like this. I have nothing that I have not received from God. Therefore, I'm going to slow down and I'm going to speak in in a loving way to this person, uh, I'm going to change my attitude so that what I speak about is accurate. And then the, th the fourth one, um, search. Search for humility in other Christians and imitate it inside your heart and in external reactions. So depend on God in prayer. Identify pride and its pattern. Destroy pride both inside your heart and its external action. And then search for humility in other Christians and imitate it inside of your heart and in external actions. Be um, humility is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Look for it in people. Go and speak to people that you, that you see are humble people and ask them how it is that they deal with the sins in their heart. And then engage in disciple relationships with a more, uh, hum a more mature, humble Christian. Engage in, a, in a, a, di a discipleship relationship with somebody. So depend on God in prayer. Identify pride in its pattern. Destroy pride both inside of your heart and its external action. Search for humility in other Christians and imitate it inside your heart and in external action. And then engage in a disciple relationship with a more mature, humble Christian so you can learn humility from them. And then finally, persevere in your fight against pride and your cultivation of humility. Persevere in it. Depend, identify, destroy, search, engage, persevere. So we've read about a king who destroyed himself very fast. And he wasn't destroyed by a great army. He wasn't destroyed by a coup. He was destroyed by an enemy that was right inside of him. He was destroyed by his pride. So as you listen to the sermon today and you are succeeding and you are happy with the way things are going, I want to issue this warning to you that you can be destroyed by an enemy that is right inside of you 
and that enemy is your own pride. Please put into action this plan. Depend on God in prayer. Identify pride in its pattern. Destroy pride both inside your heart and in its external action. Search for humility in other Christians and imitate it inside of your heart and in external action. Engage in a disciple relationship with a more mature, humble Christian and persevere in your fight against pride and your cultivation of humility. Lord, thank you for this text that you've given us to read. And you know, Lord, as you look right into each one of our hearts how proud we are. You know the pride, Lord. You know the deception. You know how deceitful we are. You know, you know how we cover up our sins. You know how we hate to be confronted and rebuked and stopped from doing the things that we really want to do. And Lord, we just pray that you would help us as we've looked at King Isaiah and we've seen that the tragic downfall in King Isaiah's 52-year reign. We've seen how everything was destroyed fast. His whole life was destroyed fast through his own pride. Help us, we pray, Lord, to see our own pride, to identify it, to depend on you in prayer. Lord, help us to be people who, who take this lesson today to heart, and that we stop and we say, no, this pride is an ugly and destructive and disgusting thing. It's even worse than the, the skin disease that Isaiah contracted. And we pray, Lord, that you would make us people who are truly humble and beautiful, as the Lord Jesus Christ is humble and beautiful. And we pray, Lord, that you would start that work right now. We pray these things in Jesus' lovely name. Amen.